Section 1 of Deeds of Daring Done by Girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. Deeds of Daring Done by Girls by Hannah Moore. The Robe of the Duchess, as told by Jehan, her page, in the Year of Grace, 1392 one tis not so quoth she and you know it and with that she fetched me a buffet on the ear now when the other pages saw me bested like that by a damsel even though she were my lady they roared and girded at me so loud that i like to have choked with rage i ran forward a step but she cried out and you touch me i'll have you whipped sir and truth she would which well i knew for i'd felt ere this old raoul's whip curling about my shoulders all on her charges too but that was some years since twas this wise that the present pother came about of a joyous afternoon in may my lady eleanor took it into her head to go into the court to see her hawk for these many months i'd been training of it for her and in all the mews there was not another flew so true aimed so swift and brought back her quarry so little torn my lady knew right well that the hawk was for her but she knew not that i thought to give it her on her feet day which fell on the morrow the bird was in fine feather not a pinion roughed her russet colour showing redly in the sun it was a barbary bird and a new hood of fine leather on her head on her feet fastened by buets of deer's hide hung two milan bells of gold the one as is ever the way with choicest bells a semitone below the other these bells i had begged from comte gaston who gave willingly enough when he knew that they were to pleasure my lady now twas not my purpose that she should see the bird till next day but womenfolk ever contrive to mix matters up i thought but to stay her to keep her jesting for a while but her anger rose and was greater than i knew she was down in the broad hall on her way to the mews and i following behind before my wits which work ever a thought slow had conjured up something to say pray mistress saith i how old be you to-morrow let me think will it be all of eleven years to tell the truth i knew her years as well as she it was nine years since my lady's mother, Dame Eleanor of Comminges, had brought and left her daughter with my lord, Gaston Phoebus, Comte de Foix. Comte Gaston was my lady's cousin, and poor Dame Eleanor, her mother, fleeing from a cruel husband, knew not where to place the child, so sought advice from Comte Gaston, a powerful and great lord. Leave her with me, saith my lord, who had taken a fancy to my little lady then but a child of three she was the first bright thing that had come to the old castle of orthez which was but a gloomy tower since in a rage my lord gaston had slain his only son and driven forth to her own people his wife the princess agnes canst thou wonder that we all loved the child none knew nor loved her better than i being that my lord gaston gave me to be her page and playfellow since there were but scullery maids and some rude wenches in the castle since the princess agnes went forth so who should doubt but that i should know my lady's age besides this i was but four years older come halloween being well grown and tall she was ever tender on the subject of her years by my lord's command she had been taught to play on the lute she could walk a measure hunt and hawk and since the new tire woman had come there had been much bravery of apparel so it twas but to tease her and keep her from the muse that i put forth all of eleven years tis not so and you know it quoth she and then came the buffet i choked down my rage and turning to those that mocked me thought to bring the laugh on her varlets cried i my lady eleanor is no longer a child she chooses you to know Twelve years old will she be to-morrow, but two years younger than our new queen Isabeau, and who knows what brave suitor comes to woo. 
at this they all laughed again as in truth i hoped they would with a black look at me and a stamp of her foot my lady turns and goes up the stair this pleased me well since the hawk was forgotten wit ye well ye shall suffer for this sneered one of the pages between whom and me there was ever discord your mistress wilt have you soundly swinged and well i pray my lord will do it himself my skin was pricking somewhat at the thought but it behoved me to show no signs of it so i looked him in the eye and flung back if my lord so much as cuffs me thou mayest do it also and with that i strolled to the mews i stroked the hawk and thought how pleased my lady would be on the morrow to have her and fly her too since to pleasure my lady my lord had passed his word that we all should fly a cast with him on the broad marshes that lay to the west a league or more long ere cock crow the next day was i astir twas a bright day for me since my lord had given me a new livery for the first time i cast away my leathern doublet and put on one of soft cloth and drew on a brave pair of chosses a red one on the right leg and a green one on the left and tied the points to my doublet it needed but only a sword to make me a man as i stole down the stair i crept into the great hall to take one look into the great mirror of purest crystal which had but lately come to my lord from a land far overseas called venice what i saw therein causeth me to turn hot since never thought i to look so fine clapping my cap on my head i ran to the mews to bathe the feet of the hawk in fair water to settle her bells and jesses and to see that the hood could be quickly cast aside soon i heard the bustle in the courtyard and hurried thither with the hawk on hand my faith but it was a joyous sight there on the highest step stood my lord and beside him my mistress eleanor my lord was smiling at her and well he might she stood beside him so straight and tall she was in a gown of green made of florence cloth and on her head was a cap bound with many chains of gold which she telleth me later came from the same faraway country as the mirror venice in their midst was set a stone big as a throstle's egg and blue as the sky on her hips hung a girdle of gold set close with little stones of this same sky blue all this i saw as i walked from the court's end coming up the steps said i in my bravest fashion mistress eleanor here is the hawk i train for thee and i set the barbary bird upon her wrist now jehan i forgive thee saith she and trust thou wilt bear in mind that i be twelve years not eleven my lord and cousin hath a gift for thee also and telleth me to give it thee now with that she hands me out a sword a brave bright sword and my lord says kindly have it ever ready in her service jehan she is a lonely maid i bent and kissed my lady's hand and saith with my heart in my mouth my lord i'll e and follow her to the world's end thou art a good lad and i trust thee and as he spoke my lord smiled true as i swore fealty to my lady i little recked how soon twould be before i rode away behind her just then the huntsman wound his horn and we all rode out over the drawbridge and away into the bright sun and green fields a hawking we made a merry day of it the hounds sped before starting up many a creature that fled affrighted from us my lady rode not her own palfrey which was a gentle animal but of little speed but a chestnut mare one specially cherished by comte gaston even though she was a thought too light for his bulk for many a day the mare had been but exercised about the court and being a high-mettled creature soon grew fretted by the flapping of my lady's habit a thing to which she was ill-used we were pricking along at a good pace my lady having her hands full holding down the mare when suddenly from the grass at her very feet darted out a fallow deer a little thing scarcely more than a month old the mare started threw up her head and ere i knew what had befallen had wheeled about and started off like the wind jehan i heard my lady call and turning my own horse about 
i spurred him after the flying mare on we sped the others passing through a copse had missed seeing our plight hold fast mistress shouted i while i strove with whip and spur to get beside her little by little we crept forward my horse and i and after that day i ever forbore to call him a poor thing first his nose pressed the mare's thigh and then he came up with the saddle cloth and then a bit ahead of that till i called loose your foot from the stirrup mistress even as i spoke i could see that she did it lean towards me and drop the reins mistress and as i spoke i switched my poor nag and leaned from the saddle took my mistress about the waist and pulled her clear of the mare it took but a moment more to set her gently on the ground and start after the mare since i knew if aught befell her our day of pleasuring would have but an ill ending freed from the flapping of the skirt she gradually slackened her pace and ere long i was leading her back to where my lady stood with the tall marsh grasses waving about her feet help me to mount jehan saith she whilst i was turning about in my mind how to urge her to let me ride the mare while she took the steadier horse pray mistress i began but she cut me short with have a care that my cousin knows not of this mishap since it fairly shames me to think how the mare bested me but i was not affrighted at this she gave a side look at me but i knew her too well to show that i had noted her white face i did not answer but pondered if it was not seemlier to guard my mistress even against herself when she noted me standing and switching of the grass she crieth out sure jehan it would be an unkind part to tell that i was like to be run with on my feet day since all has come out well promise now that thou wilt hold thy peace so promise i did and none guessed how near we had come to grief though my lord when we drew up with them wondered why the mare looked so hard ridden twas now well on to noon and we rested by the side of a clear stream and ate of squirrels fresh roasted and of little fishes drawn from the brook but half an hour before and of the honey of the wild bee spread on cakes of white flour and of spices and of wine hast had a happy day little one saith my lord as we sat neath the trees and my mistress turning laid her cheek on his hand and said dear cousin never can i thank thee enough for all that thou hast done for me and the tears like to have fallen to see thee happy gives me all the thanks i crave and my lord fetched a deep sigh thinking belike of that son whom his own hand had slain then when the sun grew low homeward we turned the pages singing as we rode along white as a lily more ruddy than the rose brilliant as a ruby that with spark of fire glows your beauty and your loveliness to me all peerless shows white as a lily more ruddy than the rose my heart for your heart watches it pleaseth me to know that to all other lovers the law of love i show white as a lily more ruddy than the rose brilliant as a ruby that with spark of fire glows two when we came in sight of the castle of orthez there rose from the great chimneys a dark cloud of smoke the drawbridge fell and the steward rode forth to meet us lo my lord he cried hasten home whilst thou wert absent here hath come a great lord the duke de berry with messages from the king hath he a great following questioned my lord seventy lances and thirty sumpter mules they are cared for my lord and all have supped we hurried forward as my lord rode into the court the duke de berry cometh through the door to meet him he was elder than my lord and was uncle to king charles and a powerful and noble lord never had i looked on one so great as he all france hath heard how he taxed his people and gathered from them great stores of money that he might have gold to buy palaces that he might get from strange and foreign countries noble pictures with which to deck his walls and tapestries wrought in colored threads and gold not only these things did he buy but books enriched with jewels and filled with images of saints and others colored with blue red and gold 
after him rode hundreds of followers when he went to war or travelled abroad in strange countries as one looked upon him his face seemeth harsh at first yet a smile became it well and he smiled when he looked on my mistress as doth every one who seeth her one two three days he tarried twas said that his matters were dispatched in one and true it is that when my mistress was before him his eyes ne'er left her face right seemly she looketh thought i as i stood behind her chair when they supped never before had she borne herself so bravely and rich were the gods that tirewoman furnished forth one evening my lady came into the great hall in a gown of cherry red made from the thread of the silkworm and wondrous soft and fine above this was a long coat with wide pointed sleeves and it was bound about her with a sash of cloth that shone like silver her hair was woven with strings of pearls large and white and over her hung a veil like unto a spider's web set full with shining threads well do i remember all this for it was the first time that ever i had seen such richness of apparel till now we had been friends together playmates the priest whom my lord gaston had brought to dwell in the castle taught us to read and when we irked him over much sent us packing then would we spend the time running over the great old castle shooting with the bow and arrow and teaching the shagged greyhounds to fetch and carry but from to-day all was different she was a great lady and i her page jehan to hand her cup to do her bidding within doors and to ride at her litter's side or by her saddle when she went abroad with my sword loosened and hand steady and prompt at her need on the fourth day my lord gaston rode out with the duke de berry to see him fare forth my mistress stood upon the steps as they set out with her sky-blue jewel in her hair and her cheeks like maybuds the duke had bent and kissed her hand and of a truth i heard him say farewell mistress thou wilt hear from me again and that shortly she saith never a word but looked into his face and smiled now once again it was jehan here and jehan there and we fell back into our old ways i digged and tilled for her the garden patch without the walls of the castle for this was a year of richness and my lady's gillyflowers and lavender lilies and coriander showed bright beside the dull pot herbs anise mustard and storax and the beds of leeks dittany lettuces and garden cress we had words over the poppies jehan saith she didst ever see the poppies brighter than they be this spring fair they be mistress and of a size too so that the seeds will be choice and none need suffer for lack of a sleeping draught if they be ill mean you to save all the flowers for seeds of truth yes mistress since they be so fine but jehan thou knowest that i love the poppies and sure they were planted for me now this was true but the flowers were so exceeding fine and gave promise of such a crop of seeds that i fairly loathed to give one up so i tried to coax mistress eleanor with other buds jehan suddenly quoth she run you to the court and fetch me out a garden tool i would help thee myself to-day i hurried away as she bade me and when i got back there she stood in the midst of the poppy bed with a wreath of them in her black hair and both hands full i stopped short and she began to laugh at me looking so like the fairies we hear of dancing in a ring that though i felt the loss of the poppy seeds sore all i could find to say was oh mistress the seeds but the flowers are so beautiful and the seeds but ill-favoured black things as thou knowest well jehan wherefore i chose the flowers there was naught to do but to hope that the buds that were left would bloom freely and shortly we went back to the castle for the day was growing warm the birds had ceased their morning songs and the wind was no longer sweet and cool as we reached the gate there came to us faint and far away the sound of a winded horn we turned and out over the marshes we could see coming many knights their armor glistening in the sun and their lances shining like so many points of fire who be these think you jehan 
said my mistress, as with her wreath of poppies she stood and watched them come. But I knew no more than she, and soon the stranger knights rode by us into the court, each man as he passed doffing his cap to my mistress, who stood tall and smiling and bowing in her turn. Jehan, quoth she, run as fast as ever thou canst, and find the tire-woman and send her to me. Perchance my cousin will wish me to come to the great hall. I was glad to be off, since I was eager to know who the great lord was that rode so bravely at the head of his vassals. In the court all was bustle, but I heard it said that he was a friend to the king, and that he bore the name of Signor Bureau de la Riviere. What was his mission to my lord none could guess, but as one day followed another, and yet he tarried, my lady's tire-woman could hold her tongue no longer, and out the secret came. Never could I bide that woman. T'was always touch and go between us. Knave, quoth she, and jade, say I, till the ill-favoured wench would to my lady Eleanor in tears. Now the secret that she blabbed was this, that the Seigneur de la Riviere had come to ask for the hand of my little mistress at the suit of the Duc de Berry. It seems that the king laughed when he heard that his uncle the duke, who had seen a round fifty years, and had sons who were men grown, wished to take to wife Una Filette, as he calleth her, of twelve years. But the duke held fast to his cause, and the king was but a lad of sixteen himself, with a wife two years younger, and many of the court were of scarce greater age. So the duke had persevered in his wishes, and the seigneur de la Riviere had come to treat with my master, the Comte de Foix who did not wish to give up his young cousin to one so much her elder. So he put off the seigneur, saying, The child is too young. Let the marriage wait till she grows up. These days I saw little of my mistress. The flowers and the dogs were all forgot, and she was housed with that tire-woman all the bright days. One morning there was an exceeding bustle and rushing hither and yon. Then was I bidden to put on my bravest suit and attend my mistress to the great hall. It took me far less time than it took my lady to put on all her fine gear, and when we came into the hall, there sat my lord, and beside him sat the stranger lord, while all around them were many score of knights and lances. My lord cometh forward, and taking my mistress by the hand, he leadeth her to a seat in the great oak chair beside him, whilst I stood but a step behind her. My lord looked at her kindly, and then, quoth he, Knowest why I sent for thee, child? My mistress drew up her head quite proud, and answered bravely, though her cheeks were like poppy buds. In truth I do, cousin. I think that thou art over young to make a marriage yet, began my lord. But my mistress saith quickly before he could go further, Dear cousin, our new queen Isabeau had but fourteen years when she wedded King Charles, and it is said that she hath meaner height than I. Her cousin smiled. Thou knowest that the Duke de Berry is far more in years than thyself. Yet methinks I could like him well, saith the Lady Eleanor, and indeed this marriage suits me much. She looked so full of spirit, and withal so fair, that the Seigneur de la Riviere thought it well to take now a part himself. Thy lady knows her mind, saith he, and for a truth the duke loves her right well. King Charles, who is a youthful liege himself, will welcome her, and at Paris she will find all things that a young maid loves. I had forgot that in my lonely castle the young maid lacked much that other maids have. Still, child, thou knowest that I have loved thee well. At this my mistress went to her cousin and knelt by his knee, holding his hand and kissing of it. Dearest cousin, she cried, there has been naught lacking in all thy kindness for me, and if it is thy wish that I stay with thee, send the seigneur hence. My lord smiled sadly and shook his head, saying with a sigh, The child has chosen for herself, my lord. Then my mistress withdrew, and I followed her. How my head spun! my mistress to wed a lord almost as great as the king himself, to go to Paris to dwell, and I, Jehan, to go with her. Of a truth, I scarce drew breath for the next ten days, 
since we were to go forth straightway, and there was hurly-burly to get us furnished forth. At the end of that time we set out towards Paris, my lord Comte sending five hundred lances to safeguard my lady, and the Duke de Berry sending as many more, with litters, chariots, jewels, and fine robes to meet us on our way. I have not speech to tell how fine we fared on that journey. At every halt great silken tents were spread, my lord duke had sent minstrels for to sing at my lady's pleasure and there were litters hung with scarlet and gold to carry her when she was aweary there were women to wait on her pages to run her bidding and jehan chief of them all always at hand with a chain of bright gold about his neck to show his new rank end of section one recording by james k white chula vista Section 2 of Deeds of Daring Done by Girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. Deeds of Daring Done by Girls by Hannah Moore. The Robes of the Duchess, as told by Jehan, her page, in the Year of Grace, 1392. Three. When we came nigh Paris, word came from my lord duke that we were to halt at the abbey of Saint-Denis, whither the king and queen, and the dukes de Berry and Burgundy, with my lady's father, were to come to welcome us. When my lady heard that her father was to come also, she turneth to me, who knew that she had not seen him since she was a small babe of three. By my faith, Jehan, quoth she, I fear my own father more than the lord I am to marry, since he is the greater stranger of the two. Why think you he cometh? Truth, I know not, my lady, say I. And it was not till later that it was known that this strange father, hearing of his daughter's beauty, and that she was to wed his friend the Duke de Berry, came forth from Paris with the king and queen to look on her. We lay that night at the abbey, and before we went to rest, heard mass in the cathedral itself never had i dreamed that so noble a building had been made by men's hands and this was but the beginning gold and silver statues stood on the great altar great colored stones the names of which i knew not sparkled on the cups and dishes of gold that were used for the holy offices while the books that the holy fathers held in their hands as well as their robes and mitres gave forth sparkles like unto a rainbow after the mass they took my lady to show her the treasures and i following behind saw with these eyes that had never thought to see such things the great golden sword of king charlemagne and so many other wonders of gold and jewels that my mind could hold them not what made my blood to stir most amid all that world of rich and holy things was a banner that hung high over the great altar Torn it was, yet in its folds glowed the color of flame, and one of the good fathers turning to me, who stood with mouth agape, I doubt not, asked, Good lad, knowest thou what banner hangest there? Nay, father, answered I, and how should I, since I am but newly come from the faraway castle of Orthes, which, as thou knowest, lies in the lonely marshes to the west? Look, son, then spoke he, at the greatest treasure of france tis the oriflamme that sacred banner which hath led her hosts so oft to victory and as i looked on it and knew how many brave knights had found death under its folds my heart was fuller than ever before for what is more noble than to give one's life for one's country even a poor page may do that though he may never hope to fall under a banner which may be borne only by princes and nobles that night I slept on a monk's pallet, spread on the floor of the passage without my lady's door. Yet were my dreams always of war and clashings of arms, and there floated ever through my visions that wondrous banner of flame color. Next morn we were all astir with the dawn. Twas my task to see that my lady's litter had been made fresh and seemly, that the pages were all point device in their looks so that we should not bear our part ill 
before the nobles coming from paris to greet us about sunset they arrived the king rode at the head of them all with his two uncles on either hand the duc de berry on the right and the duc de burgoyne on the left behind came the queen and her ladies in an open car and on either side rode the great lords two by two carrying their swords and shining in their armour of gold the duc de berry cometh forward and taking my lady by the hand led her to the king who kissed her on the brow and then took her to the queen they were so handsome these two the queen and my lady that all marvelled thereat queen isabeau was of a fairness like unto milk and roses while my lady who stood a full hand taller was of a dark brownness which looked but the darker beside the golden-haired queen shortly the queen turneth to a tall and dark noble who stood behind her and saith she with a smile well comte hast thou naught to say then he came forward and taking the hand of my lady in his looketh her long in the face at last he looks less stern and then he saith if thou hadst looked like thy mother child thou and i hadst not met to-day but i see well thou art my own child and carry in thy brow and eyes the colour of a true daughter of Auvergne. one needed only to look at them as they stood side by side to see that they were of one race he like the king kisseth my lady on the brow and then he turneth to the duke de berry and placing in his hand the little one of my lady he saith one may not wonder longer at your choice my lord duke this night like the last one we lay in the abbey but there was feasting and gaiety at least as much as seemed good in a holy house then next day we took our way to paris my lady riding in the car with the queen and her ladies and i looked on her with marvel to see how one who had scarce seen aught but a squire's lady and the wenches about the castle and those who had taught us could bear herself so bravely as if all her life she had known aught but courts then after a brief space cometh the marriage at paris where king charles himself giveth the bride away for five days there were masks and feastings balls and jousts in which even the king takes a part many of these balls were at the palace of st paul where lived the king and queen some there were at the hotel de la reine blanche where dwelt the queen of navarre and there were others yet at the hotel de nel which the duke de berry gave to my mistress the duchess eleanor for her wedding gift methought we had been merry at orthes but at paris it was like a minstrel's tale who can wonder that my mistress was happy she sang and danced my lord duke adored her everybody loved her for her sweet and gentle ways and there were none about the palace but that she knew and cared for jehan she saith to me one day art thou happy here yea mistress since this great city is to be my home dost thou never think of those days when we trained the dogs at orthes faith and i do mistress though it is but seldom and i love the brave doings here besides where thou goest there must jehan follow the days slipped away and were none too long i fed the pet squirrel with its collar of fair pearls which the king had given to my mistress and the monkey too and the flying birds for my mistress loved ever to have antic creatures about her at the hunts i ride close at hand and as at orthes where my mistress the duchess goeth there goeth jehan once when we chased the deer at val la reine the stag a weary and dazed took refuge in a barn our king the well-beloved crieth out spare him spare him for the huntsman ran into the barn to cut the poor beast's throat then saith the king from his kind heart never shall this deer be hunted more his life shall be his own from this day forth saying which he pulled from his saddle-cloth a splendid fleur-de-lis and turned to some of his men for a chain with which to hang it on the creature's neck none had one so my duchess took from her own neck a chain of gold and it was hanged about the deer's neck to show that it was the king's and none might do it ill 
each day there was some new sport and i had scant time to do aught but follow my mistress as one morn she stood playing with the monkey a beast that had no regard for my fingers but was ever pleased to be petted by my duchess my lady's eyes roved to the beds of gay posies that bloomed without on the terrace they put to shame the ones we tended in the old days by the castle wall but my duchess cried there is not a posy here as bright as the poppies that grew at orthez nor one so white as the gillyflowers twas a pretty garden and i loved it well yet i cannot say but what i loved these too she stepped out on the terrace and called back over her shoulder see that the cup of gold that the monkey broke be mended i love not this task since it seemed a shame to me that so grievous a beast should have his food from so fair a cup while many of his betters had none soon after my mistress was wedded to my lord duke the great fair of saint denis was set out in the meadow pre eau claire thither went we with the king queen and all the court such marvels as were spread out there for sale jewels and stuffs wrought with gold and gems pictures and holy books painted in colors and with gold carvings made from wood and from the great white teeth of strange beasts which they saith live in the sea cups of gold shaped like unto lilies and roses swords and spears battle-axes and shields armor and horse trappings till one knew not which way to turn if it was a fine show in daytime my certes what a sight it was at night every stall was ablaze with torches and there were crowds of strange peoples of diverse colors and from faraway lands with soldiers and singers on every hand my mistress had never seen before such a sight no more than i and she chose many a rich and curious toy and my lord duke smiled and gave her all her heart's desire yet think not that my lady had ever gods and merry doings in her mind being but young she loved these well as what young maid does not but her heart was ever loyal to her friends as presently i shall set forth four it befell after we had dwelt three years in paris and my duchess was just turned of fifteen that there was tumult at the court king charles the well-beloved whose fits of madness caused so much havoc owing to the mischief wrought by his uncles when he was too ill of mind and body to rule himself was again out of his mind the seigneur de la riviere whom my duchess had ever loved since he had arranged her marriage and fetched her to paris to my lord the duc de berry was by the order of the duc de burgundy seized and held to die his friends lest they too should suffer for it feared to help him the king as hath been said was ill the queen cared not what happened so long as she was not irked but my duchess clenched her little hand and saith he shall not die just how to serve him she knew not so she cometh to her lord the duke de berry and cast herself on her knees before him oh my dear lord cried she sobbing this man who hath done no wrong and whom we know and love must die since none but i durst speak for him the duke who loved her well raised her and saith take comfort dear one but my lord what comfort is there for me when one who gave me happiness and thee is in danger of his life and for no wrongdoing neither dear heart answered my lord the duke i too love him since he brought thee to me and what man can do that will i for thy sake and his if he be not saved then will i sorrow always wept my duchess my lord duke went forth and though the king was only at times come to his wits again my lord got from him a command that the seigneur de la riviere should be sent overseas and not slain this did but half content my mistress when the king grew well again my duchess pled with him so prettily that as he loved right well to pleasure her he allowed the seigneur de la riviere to come home and to him restore all his castles and his wealth greatly my mistress rejoiceth and giveth thanks to both her lord and the king now the seigneur when once more in honor and in wealth he came to his home 
in token for his thanks for all she had wrought in his behalf brought to my mistress a coffer filled with rich gifts the coffer was in itself a marvel since it was painted all over with little flying boys who bore in their hands flowers and wreaths all the rest of it was like unto gold and it stood upon four feet cut in the shape of great paws when the coffer was opened there seemeth no end to the splendid things my mistress brought forth tissues glistening like moonbeams wrought stuffs of many colors and chains and jewels chiefest amongst the rich treasures was a length of velvet from the great city called genoa the mate to which was not in all the court it was blue in color the which my mistress ever loveth just the shade of the sky of a sunny day at noon wrought all over it in threads of purest silver were flying doves my faith it seemed as if their long wings fairly moved oh cried my duchess eleanor never was such a lovely robe seen before and it cometh just in time too since the ball that queen blanche giveth to the queen's maid on her marriage will be shortly my duchess had the velvet fashioned into a robe so splendid that all marvelled it fell from her shoulders and flowed three metres length upon the floor and the doves of silver fluttered and shone with every step she taketh above her brow rose the tall hennen that queen isabeau so loved to wear and to have the ladies of her court wear also and from this fell a veil of silver like unto the doves the night of the ball was at hand and none looking on my stately duchess would deem that she had but fifteen years so heavy was the robe and of such length that as i walked behind i bore it for her the palace shone bravely with torches and flambeaux set in the wall and borne in the hands of many lackeys all about the rooms our king the well-beloved no longer ill was full of pleasure at the masks which had been planned for this ball he was scarce older than was i since he was but nineteen years and when he was not ill ever loved to mingle in all the sports going forward the dancing had come to an end quickly a space was cleared and as i stood behind my lady a loud voice crieth out the wild men the wild men give the wild men room of a truth they were frightful to see five chained together led by a sixth who leaped along in front shouting all of them being covered with long shaggy hair after the manner of some strange beasts as the mummers passed for they were but dressed to look like wild men i tweaked betwixt finger and thumb a bit of the fur and lo it was but raveled toe now i knew right well why the word had been passed that none with lights should move about the room with what wild shouts did the mummers leap here and there amongst the guests some were affrighted and ran screaming away the leader of them all runneth up to my mistress dost thou know me cried he right firmly she held him by the hand not yet saith she but shall ere i let thee go then my blood froze with the horror of a scream i heard then another and another in an instant mummers guests room and all were in a blaze one of the company to see the mummers better had seized a torch and held it near them the toe sprang into flame and the five men who were tied together were instantly on fire and shrieking out one only loosed himself and ran and plunged into a tank for washing of the silver and which happened to be full of water all through the tumult and cries there stood my duchess mid the flying brands which i fought as best as i might with cap and hands come away i cried oh mistress come nay help me to save him jehan was what she whispered back her fair veil shriveled with the heat the flying slivers blistered her arms and neck cries of the king the king save the king grew loud and louder queen isabeau fainted yet my brave duchess stood there till every flying spark had been stamped out holding gathered about her the heavy velvet robe when at last the fire was all subdued she threw aside the blue robe that had been so fair and there under its scorched folds in his monstrous suit of tow knelt the king safe and unharmed hasten sire cried she 
the queen waiteth you throw over you jehan's cloak lest some wanton spark fly near you the king hurried away and then think not but that i hasten to get my mistress home and oh my lord's pride and my lady and oh the king's words when he came next morn to thank her kneeling on one knee to kiss her hand the sky-blue robe you say what became of that my mistress packed it away in the coffer that had brought it from genoa with her own hands and from that time my lord taketh for his pennon one of sky-blue ground with a silver dove set in its midst end of section two recording by james k white chula vista Section 3 of Deeds of Daring Done by Girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Deeds of Daring Done by Girls by Hannah Moore. The Princess Wins, Year 1417, Part 1. In my own youthful days, when turning over the leaves of story-books, I used to pause at those tales which began, Once Upon a Time. I always had a feeling that there was something of the fairy tale about stories which began in this fashion, and I should like so to begin this day. For truly the story I am about to tell you is but one incident in the life of a girl whose whole career was so full of ups and downs, alas, most often downs, that it reads, even in the solemn old Dutch documents, like the most fanciful tale of the imagination. When she died at thirty-seven, it seems as if our Jacqueline had dared everything and lost, lost kingdom, home, and friends. Yet even in a life so full of disaster, there were some bright spots, and in this story you will hear how once at least our princess wins. She was born, our heroine, at her father's palace at the Hague on St. James's Day, 1401. The little girl was baptized Jacoba, in honor of the holy day of her birth, Jacobus being the Latin form of the name James. Gradually Jacoba was changed into the French form of Jacqueline, though in the strange old documents of the times, her name is written as Jacob, or Jacques, or sometimes Madame Jake, and even often as Jacques de Bavière. Jacqueline was born a princess, and when she was three years old had the title given her of Daughter of Holland, as she was the sole heir and successor of her father, William the Sixth, Count of Holland, who on the death of his father had succeeded him as Count of Zealand and Hainault. In the Middle Ages, when might made right, possessions were held in many cases by him who had the strongest arm who could muster the greatest number of followers, and had the most powerful connections. Marriage with princes who had great possessions of land, or would inherit them, was one of the ways by which sovereigns of small states strengthened their positions, and this was one reason why mere babies were given in marriage by their parents. You see, the parents could not go to war against each other when it was arranged that their children were to be married when they grew up. Little Jacqueline was no exception to the rule, and before she was quite five years old, was formally betrothed to John, Duke of Touraine, second son of Charles VI of France, called the Well-Beloved. The betrothal of Jacqueline to her bridegroom of nine years old took place in the old French town of Compiègne, where both the French and Dutch courts were present. The fine old palace with its great number of rooms was elegantly furnished for the occasion, and the little Jacqueline had in her company Stays, Jan, and Hans, her drummer, piper, and trumpeter. Now these were very important personages in those times. They amused the company when there was nothing else to be done. They had their duties among the soldiers, and in some of the old papers which are still preserved, and which show the expenses of the betrothal down to the last groot, it is duly set down that Stays, Jan, and Hans are each to have six French crowns to cover their traveling expenses. This would be equal to about nine dollars of our money. Neither of the fathers of the two children were present at the betrothal. 
for king charles had one of his attacks of insanity and count william had been bitten by a dog and was not able to be there either but the mothers had seen to it that nothing was lacking to make the ceremony a handsome one the dutch expense account tells of new clothes for everybody connected to jacqueline even those who had to stay at home having wedding garments and fine new hat bands when the betrothal ceremonies were over the young bridegroom was handed over to jacqueline's mother and the two children were taken home to holland to be brought up together from time to time they had presents sent to them from their subjects which seemed more like taxes than free gifts and which were duly set down in the archives for instance there were fish and wine for john and there were many ells of very fine cloth of silk for madame jake they had very special dispensations sent them too so that they could eat meat on fast days and this dispensation was extended also to the napkin bearer the cook and ten other servants who had to taste the dishes beforehand you see our jacqueline lived in the days when people were sometimes poisoned by their enemies so that royalty had tasters who ate of every dish before it was placed on the table for their majesties to eat and if the tasters did not suffer why then it was deemed safe for their masters to eat notwithstanding all these things the children passed many happy years studying french english and latin and in hunting hawking riding on horseback playing tennis and ball and best of all in skating on the long winding canals perhaps they skated the dutch roll and hans stays and jan went along too to make things merry with the fife trumpet and drum these were their pleasures it was a more solemn matter when they had to learn how to rule their kingdoms and subjects for the little bridegroom stood next but one to the great throne of france and jacqueline was heir to her father's kingdom they were married in 1415 when jacqueline was 14 years old two years later her young husband who by the death of his elder brother had become dauphin and heir to the throne of france died the poor lad breathed his last at compiegne in the very palace where he had been betrothed whether by poison or from getting overheated at tennis none can say but at any rate while he was away from his wife and from his family as if this was not enough just two months later count william the kind and loving father of jacqueline died also the poor girl without father or husband to protect her or her possessions turned to her fatherland to pronounce her sovereign of zealand and Hainaut. but there were others who had their eyes and minds fixed on the sturdy little kingdom and truth to tell they were the last persons one would suspect of such ideas since they were jacqueline's own kinfolk but so it was and in order to strengthen her position and to allow her subjects to know and love her and to pay her their vows of fealty jacqueline as was the custom of those times started on a progress or tour through her various cities these royal progresses were very splendid affairs we can hardly imagine them now and on this occasion jacqueline's mother bore her company and there were many of her most powerful nobles as well on june twelfth fourteen seventeen when the cavalcade rode into mons the whole city was gay to welcome the young girl who came thither to take her vows of sovereignty how prettily the city old even then must have looked from the windows fluttered banners of bright colored cloth many of them worked with patterns of gold and silver so large were some of these banners that they stretched from window to window across the street many were the arches wreathed with flowers and branches under which jacqueline passed and streamers waved everywhere leaning from the casements were ladies richly dressed and holding chains of flowers and children were here there and everywhere come to see their little princess who was scarce more than a child herself many great lords were there as well having come forth from their castles on the wooded hills of Hainaut, followed by their retainers and serfs the former clad in suits of bright armor and riding on horseback while the latter ran on foot beside the men-at-arms and bore on their collars the names of their masters 
and their doublets were of leather, and many times their feet were bare. Shek Lin on a milk-white palfrey, with her mother at her left hand, rode at the head of them all. There are a few quaint old pictures which show her to have been slender and tall, brown-haired, and without the high cheekbones which are so usual in her countrywomen. On this occasion her appearance was royal indeed. She wore a gown of cloth of gold, which glittered in the warm June sunshine. Her coif, or headdress, was bound by many a chain of gold and jewels, suitable to her rank as Dauphin of France and daughter of Holland. She had not advanced far within the city before a deputation of young girls, all dressed in white, stood forth to meet her. Hail, daughter of Holland, welcome to Mons, the leader of them said, and stepping forward, hung her chaplet of flowers on Jacqueline's arm. One by one, each young girl followed in turn, and Jacqueline, turning with smiling face to her mother, said, our good city of Mons shows its loyalty in pleasing fashion, madame. If all our other cities bear themselves like this, we care not for our uncle of Burgundy, who seeks to take our inheritance from us, nor for the Egmonts, nor Arkells, nor any who are enemies of our house. In truth, all seemeth fair, my daughter. Our good burghers always respond to our need though our nobles sometimes think too highly of their power. Our loyal burghers, in truth they are our best friends, yet remember how many nobles ride with us this day, and have sworn to urge our cause as though it were their own. They rode slowly forward, the little princess pleased and happy at the homage of their subjects, bowing and smiling. At last the church of St. Waltrude was reached. Here Jacqueline dismounted and entered the dim old building, walking slowly up the central aisle till she reached the high altar. Here she knelt, kissed the holy relics, and swore to preserve all usages and privileges of the city, to protect the church, to uphold the right, to dispel the wrong. Then, seated on a lofty throne that had been set up beside the altar, she received the homage of her subjects and their vows of loyalty to her and to her cause. After the solemn ceremonies at the church were over, the royal party had a banquet given in their honor by the burghers of the city, who had arranged many festivities to give them pleasure. Can you not see our princess with rosy cheeks and sparkling eyes standing at the table's head? Her soft brown hair is tightly bound to her head, and covered with a cap wrought with threads of gold strung with pearls. Embroidery of threads of gold and colored silks in which the Dutch excelled, and richer gown, which is of the heaviest silk that even Flanders can produce. Long chains of pearls, which were sold by weight, hang about her neck, and fur of Minever binds and edges the cuts and slashes in her great sleeves and on the body of her gown. Besides the banquet, there was planned a tournament, a favorite occasion for showing knightly deeds, and it was to be held on a grassy mead just without the walls of the city, on the day following the paying of homage and entry into the city. Thither early in the morning trooped the inhabitants of the town. Among the first to go were groups of apprentices, dressed in the uniforms of their guilds or trade societies. These trudged on foot, glad enough of a holiday. Mingling among them were serfs or bondsmen, easily to be told by their metal collars. Some carried burdens for their masters who should arrive later in the day, while some merely swung a cudgel and hurried on as if conscious of their lowly position. As the day wore on, the road was dusty with the men-at-arms, knights, nobles, and their attendants, with the substantial burghers with their apprentices, and with the groups of maidens from the town eager to see the gay company and looking pretty enough themselves in their close-fitting white caps and scarlet kirtles. Only occasionally walking sedately by her father's side, shrouded in a long cloak to keep her clothes fresh from the dust, came some tradesman's daughter, her neck encircled with the strings of coral beads and her gold earrings handed down through many generations, 
a trifle longer than those of the serving maidens, and the inevitable cap edged with lace, or of finest plated muslin, while theirs, though snowy white, were of coarse material. Now and again, amid the crowd swung covered litters, bearing either the wife of some dignitary or some high official who preferred this manner of traveling to going on horse or muleback. At an hour past noon, out from the palace yard rode a troop of men on horseback, bright in a livery of orange and black. Their business it was to clear the road of any such as cumbered it, so that the passage to the field should be kept free, since the Princess Jacqueline would ride thither on her palfrey to show herself to her subjects, who had prepared the tournament, in her behalf. As the cavalcade issued from the palace yard, there came first two score knights riding two abreast, each in a full suit of armor which sparkled like silver in the sun, each carrying his shield and a pennon of bright silk. Then came the members of the Council of Mons, in rich robes of velvet, furred and wrought, and showing on their breasts the heavy gold chains of their office. They were men who showed on their faces intelligence and a sense of the importance of their office, slow to smile and grave, but true as steel to what they deemed the right, and loyal subjects when once won to their sovereign. Next came Jacqueline, with her mother beside her, both riding on splendid horses, whose comparison was as rich as cloth and gold could make it. Right royalty shone our princess, robed in a gown of damask which showed in the patterned tulips of many shades, the flower of all others most dear to the Dutch heart, the which were made richer yet by stitchery of brilliant silks. Around the neck and long sleeves, which reached almost to her feet, were bands of ermine fur, and beneath the flowing cap, made truly in the very shape of those worn by the peasant maidens, her hair was bound with many a string of pearl. Behind her came those who were to take part in the tournament, and never had Mons, staid old city, seen a sight of such splendor. Forty knights came ahead at a stately pace, each mounted on a noble steed in trappings of velvet, for the steeds of the fallen knights became the prizes of the victors, and it was a matter of pride to have both horse and harness worthy to be a prize. After the knights rode forty ladies, chosen for their beauty, all richly dressed in colors of the gayest hues, mounted on palfreys, each one riding alone, and leading by a silver chain a knight completely armed for tilting, astride a splendid horse, which also wore armor, and a plume of feathers. Minstrels and trumpeters followed, blowing on their instruments, and then came the people, shouting and cheering, and hurrying along so as not to miss any of the sport at the field. It was a lovely sight that met their eyes when the mead was reached. The grassy sward was dotted with gay and constantly changing groups. Bright awnings and banners were stretched to keep off the sun from spectators and combatants, and almost encircling the tilting ground were fine trees, beneath whose shade many horses were tethered, while their attendants lounged on the grass. So busy were all with the scene before them that none noted the cloud rising dark above the horizon and he who called attention to it would have been but deemed a churl for his pains. In the little enclosure set apart for the princess and her immediate attendants, the hangings were of equal splendor with the rest of the arrangements. It was hung with gay strips of cloth and with the chains of flowers, and it was placed midway between the lists so that the tilting could be seen to the best advantage. All was ready. The heralds rolled forth, each with his silver trumpet at his lips, prepared to announce the opening of the fray, when a long, rolling peal of thunder startled alike the spectators in the stands, as well as those who stood upon the greensward, pressing eagerly forward to see the first shock of the encounter. The first peal was followed by another, and another. The wind whirled across the wide meadow and tore into shreds the awnings which had been stretched against the sun. Rain descended in floods, and before Jacqueline and her party could take shelter in the rude stalls that had been built below the galleries, and in which the horses were stabled, they were pelted with hailstones so large, and which came with such force, that one of them left on Jacqueline's cheek a cruel bruise. 
Even centuries later, and in our own country, women and girls were burned as witches, and when our daughter of Holland lived, many things which would seem quite natural to us were called omens, and were supposed to foretell either good or ill. This hailstorm was judged as a bad omen for poor Jacqueline. So strong a hold did it take on the superstitious people that while many important transactions and details of history are lost, a full account of this storm has been left in various Dutch documents, with fabulous tales as to the size of the hailstones, and that they killed cattle and ruined crops. Thus sadly ended for Princess Jacqueline the day that had opened so fair. Right bravely did she bear the hurried ride back into the city. With her mother she withdrew into the apartments as soon as they reached Mons, and was seen no more that night. Indeed so wrought upon Jacqueline by the great storm and the misfortune attending it, that, as soon as they were alone, she exclaimed to her mother, "'Let us away as soon as our train can be made ready.' "'Nay, dear child, that would but incense our good people of Mons, who did their best to pleasure and to honour you. "'But, mother, that is all past, and see the grievous bruise upon my cheek? "'It ill becomes the face of a princess.' That it does, my dearest, but it is but just to remember that, cruel though it might be, unguments and laving it with soft water will heal it, and by the morrow thy cheek will show no stain. Neither must thou forget that for this bruise none of thy subjects should be blamed. To this the little princess made no reply, yet could not her mother induce her to remain longer in the city, and shortly after sunrise the next morning, the cavalcade took their way from the city of Mons, Jacqueline traveling in the litter, since she chose not to show herself again in that ill-omened place. The Princess Wins, Part 2 After the mishap at Mons, the young princess journeyed to other of her loyal towns, to Delft, to Leiden, to Amsterdam, and Harlem. Though all these cities paid homage to Jacqueline, as their sovereign, and supported her claims to Zealand and Hainault, there was a strong party growing up against her, chiefly on account of her youth, and because she was a girl. The headquarters of this party was at Dordrecht, the one city which refused to pay homage to Jacqueline. Here in Dordrecht, the leaders of the opposing party were joined by one of the uncles of Jacqueline, known as John the Pitiless, who was eager to rob his niece of her inheritance. He proposed to be appointed governor, and in this way gradually get his own hands on the whole power. Now indeed Jacqueline showed that she was strong at heart, for though but sixteen, she immediately took steps in person to suppress all such designs on the part of her uncle, and levied troops, gathered supplies, and started towards the rebellious Dordrecht. Right bravely she looked, our little princess, as she rode at the head of her troops, and ever from time to time she turned to her mother with a bright smile and some such word as, Courage, dear madame, ever saw you troops with braver front than ours? Or, after a pause, Think you that mine uncle of Burgundy will expect to see us in person, come to defend our rights? Thou art a brave girl. Wouldst that thy father wert here to guard and guide thee. But her mother looked anxious and as she rode in her litter near her daughter, it was she who from time to time called to her side those brave nobles who had espoused her daughter's cause, and to whose advice she looked to bring the assault to a successful conclusion. After the first day's march, Jacqueline's bright confidence was shaken. Wearied with being all day at the saddle and bearing the weight of her suit of armor, even though the shirt was of the finest Milan steel and flexible and light, Jacqueline dismissed all her attendants and begged her mother to bide with her for a space before going to rest. When all were gone, and they were alone together, and the curtains to the tent secured, poor Jacqueline, but a tired girl after all, cast herself down beside her mother and hid her face in her lap. "'Oh, mother,' cried she, "'methinks I'd give all Dordrecht to be once more in our own palace of the Hague.' safe sheltered in mine own room and rid of this armor which chafes me so 
nay daughter speak not so loud bend thy lips to mine ear for truly it would shame you much should the men-at-arms without hear thy plaints but mother lower dear child speak lower what weeping countess of hainault and daughter of holland shedding tears thy daughter was i mother before i was daughter of holland so fearsome am i of those cruel men we go to meet with their spears and arrows methinks that already i feel them in my flesh and at the very thought there were fresh showers of tears can this be my brave princess is this the maid of whom her father said brave as a lad with more wisdom than her years and better fitted to rule than many an elder one sure child the hailstones have in truth bewitched thee ah mother i will be brave to-morrow since needs i must but say thou wilt not leave me this night stay with me the darkness affrights me mother truly i had no thought not to stay with thee dear child see give me thy hand and i will sit beside thy couch till thou art fast asleep jacqueline threw herself on the couch which had been hastily spread in her tent and made soft with the skins of fox and bear and drew over her buckskin doublet a cloak of frieze kiss me mother as though i were once more thy little daughter and leave me not and holding her mother's hand as she had done in babyhood our poor little daughter of holland from very weariness fell fast asleep before dawn the next day all the camp was astir the sound of the armor is at work the stamping and neighing of horses the shouts of the soldiers as they hurried about their labor made a din quiet out of variance with the quiet of the night when the only sounds which disturbed the solitude were the cries of the sentries that all was well and the occasional whinny of some restive horse yet still jacqueline slept on and by her side her mother watched hoping that the sounds from without would penetrate the deep sleep of the weary girl at last the door of the tent itself sounded the notes of the bugle and jacqueline started up her eyes clear and flashing as she turned to the patient watcher at her side once more countess of hainault dearest lady she cried jacqueline the little girl has fled back to her childhood her mother drew a long breath and smiled in return let us praise st james for that she answered and pushed aside the hanging folds that covered the opening to the tent so that the fresh morning air would sweep within hail lady a bright awakening and a joyous day and forward pressed two pages special attendants to jacqueline herself and like her dressed in suits of bright armor but while theirs glittered as bravely as hers on her helmet on her shield and on any small spot which offered a space for the tool of the goldsmith there were wrought the various heraldic devices which belonged to the countess by right of her great and royal descent the younger of the two pages so young in fact that his cheek was scarce less rosy and fair than that of his young mistress bore her sword and spear which gleamed in the cold beams of the wintry sun the elder of the two carried her shield and pennon the last of the fine blue silk showing the arms of bavaria quartered with those of the hainault holland and watching over these was deftly embroidered the image of the virgin and the child jacqueline came to the door of her tent and as her eyes watched the busy scene she looked both rested and well pleased a fair omen for the daughter of holland this day she said and pointed towards the lad stood by with her pennon the bright clouds in the sky had but touched the faces of the holy virgin and the child and reflected in the silver threads with which they were wrought caused them to glow with almost the colors of true flesh and blood the countess speaks well said eberhard lord of hootwood than whom jacqueline had no more faithful follower and who had just come up from the camp to see how the young countess had rested a fair sleep and a long one thanks to my lady mother said jacqueline turning to her with a loving glance who was ever wont to take upon her own shoulders the burden of my humours full well did jacqueline repay the kindness of her mother by her love for that lady which her dignity never caused her for a moment to conceal going once more within the tent she bathed in water fresh and cold and though the air was thought too keen 
she had the armorer summoned to rivet on her greaves so that the legs below the knee would be well protected lest some who were on foot among the enemy might get near and do her harm bring my helmet next she ordered and sling it to my saddle bow for this cap of velvet shall serve me to wear till we near the troops which my false uncle hath gathered kissing her mother she whispered in her ear fear not lady i be a lad this day and then placing her spurred foot on the knee of her page she mounted easily on to her saddle once on the back of her war-horse her courage rose higher still and seizing her pennon in her hand she drove her horse onward shouting in her sweet young voice on for the love of the daughter of holland and death to those that defy her across the low bare fields and through the scrubby woods rode the small army which numbered barely a couple thousand of men when the sun stood high in the heavens and showed the hour of noon though the wind was keen and little comfort was to be had they rested for the sake of the horses as well as the men whilst they stopped thus and with fires and food sought to take such ease as they could command a band of picked men less than a score rode forward to gain what news they might of the enemy soon they could be seen spurring quickly back and they brought the welcome news that john the pitiless was encamped just without the town of grocum that the men were scattered about as if preparing to halt for the remainder of the day and that they had learned from some faithful adherence to the princess jacqueline that her uncle had been able to muster scarce five hundred men more than were in her own little army at this news all sprung to their saddles since the brief winter's day was all too short for that which they had to do and jacqueline with helmet on her head and sword in hand rode at their head scarce an hour's brisk riding brought them in sight of the army gathered from among those who opposed the princess there was much confusion evident among them and it seemed as if they had just learned of the approach of the daughter of holland and were preparing to hold their own as the best they might straight as an arrow forward to where his pennon showed the presence of her uncle rode jacqueline no need to shout encouragement to the brave men at her back yet ever and again she would turn and call for the love of holland or for the virgin and saint james and ever and anon would come back the answering cry for the love of holland for saint james when almost within the flight of an arrow from the enemy once again did jacqueline turn and this time her cry was borne back on the wind with the clearness of a trumpet for the love of the daughter of holland at this the hoarse shout that rose among her followers could have been heard a league away still keeping her horse's head straight for that pennon she had marked so well she sent her pages to the right and left bidding the soldiers spread in a wide circle and never draw rein till they had circled the enemy on they came like a whirlwind the enemy seeming not to know what manner of tactics they were like to meet formed a compact body the rushing mass of men and horses with jacqueline at their head swept madly on nor paused nor swerved till they had flung themselves against the enemy in a moment all was frightful confusion men unhorsed and being trampled underfoot by the riderless steeds and in many cases the horses suffering themselves from wounds that had fallen on them instead of their masters twice above all the tumult and din of metal when spear met shield or helmet could be heard the cry for the daughter of holland and each time it brought back the answering shout at these moments even when the enemy seemed to waver as if they had not dreamed that the hereditary princess could be there in the thick of a battle in her own person surrounded by the noblest of her kin and those of the highest rank among her party jacqueline never gave a thought to her own safety from right to left she flew encouraging here supporting there bringing up laggards to harass a weak spot among the enemy's forces by the sheer might of her presence striking awe among the foe at last one more stolid or more cruel than the rest rode straight at her his lance thrust at her breast the good male shirt she wore and her trusty shield turned aside the blow but so sharp was the shock that she fell off her horse now indeed came in that training in horsemanship 
on which her father had ever insisted and in which she had been practiced since her earliest years still clinging to the bridle she managed to keep from falling and with the aid of her faithful pages who kept ever at her saddle she managed to regain her seat now by all i hold dear cried she no mercy shall be shown to the enemies of holland and my house from that moment with voice and example she inspired her weary men till the fall of the dusk on the december day they routed those that were still left alive and sent them flying over the waste country back at dordrecht many of the enemies of jacqueline and her house fell during this battle the most noted and most vindictive as well being that william of arkell to whom her father desired to her to wed in the interests of peace but who stubbornly refused our little princess and always remained one of her most bitter foes her uncle john the pitiless escaped and returned to dordrecht with the remnant of his forces nor was this the only effort he made to capture her lands but for years he pursued her relentlessly and did not hesitate at any means to gain his end involved in endless wars and intrigues both with enemies within her own land as well as those abroad the battle at grocum was the only time when jacqueline daughter of holland led her troops in person and no amount of persuasion could induce her to assume command again the night of the victory at grocum the little army encamped within the city which they had wrested from the burgundian party and the celebration of this happy event was accompanied with feasting and much joy a thousand healths were drunk to jacqueline countess and commander and there were toasts to future victories and the rosiest anticipations of success the victors imagining that because of one triumph their enemies would be vanquished when the daughter of holland laid herself down to sleep that night her mother with a happy face bent to kiss her good night mother dear lady whispered this victorious countess of sixteen i pray you tell no one that last night i wept from fear her mother smiled as she kissed her and answered in her gentle voice thou hast my promise end of section three Section 4 of Deeds of Daring Done by Girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Deeds of Daring Done by Girls by Hannah Moore. Defense of Castle Dangerous, Year 1692, Part 1. The sun shone bright and warm on the little frontier settlement of Verchere, one crisp October morning in the year 1692. Though the settlement was small, it was pleasantly placed on the south shore of the St. Lawrence River, not more than 20 miles from Montreal, which was considered but a short distance from a place of safety in those days when homes were being hewn out of the wilderness. The seigneur, or governor of the place, was an old soldier formerly a captain in the renowned regiment of Carignan, which was sent to New France to give aid and protection to the settlers and to assist them in repelling the Iroquois. The officers of this great regiment were rewarded for their services by large grants of land along the rivers, which were for many years the great highways. The officers in turn rented out the land to the soldiers under them, and none save the colonel himself was allowed to return to France so anxious was that country to increase the population of its colonies when our story opens seigneur Verchere was on military duty at quebec his wife had gone on a visit to montreal and they had left the little family at home in charge of madelon the only daughter a girl about fourteen years old there were two young brothers louis a lad of twelve and alexander who was about a year younger there were Besides, the settlers who looked on Madelon as the representative of her father. We can hardly picture to ourselves what a very rude place this settlement was, and as it lay near the trail of the Iroquois, it had become known throughout New France as Castle Dangerous. At this time, the Iroquois, containing the strong and invincible Five Nations, had two motives which swayed their savage breasts most powerfully. 
These were love of fighting and love of gain. They were dependent on the Dutch and English at Albany for guns, powder, lead, brandy, and many other things which the white man had brought with him from the old world, and which these children of the woods had come to regard only too quickly as necessary for their comfort. True, beaver skins could buy these things which they coveted, but with the Iroquois the supply was limited. The great forests stretching to the west and northwest, and those of the upper lakes, were occupied by tribes who were bound to French interests, and it was the French traders who controlled their immense annual product of furs. Every summer there was a great fair at Montreal, where the trading for a whole year took place and the remote tribes brought in their accumulated beaver skins. The Iroquois saw and envied these furs and the strong waters which they enabled their possessors to buy, so they became more than ever bent on mastering all this traffic by first conquering the tribes. The Dutch and English urged them on, for the Hurons, Ottawas, and other tribes were the children of the French, working in their interest and protected by them while French and Indians alike were enemies of the Iroquois. Thus it was no accidental attack that the French had to fear at Castle Dangerous, but a determined effort by a race that could put nearly 3,000 warriors in the field, and that constantly increased this force by adopting captives into the tribes. The settlement at Castle Dangerous consisted of the blockhouse, a strong building made of timbers, of the house of the seigneur, some rude shacks, and the fort itself, which was connected with the blockhouse by a covered way. All of the settlers lived in these buildings for safety, since their pitiless enemy, the Iroquois, had always to be guarded against. There were as well bands of wandering Indians that were constantly passing up and down the trail that lay along the St. Lawrence River. Rude and dangerous as the place seemed, Madelon loved it, since it was home to her. She was brave and had been trained by her father in the use of firearms, to be cool in the face of danger, and quick to meet emergencies. The morning of the 22nd of October broke fair. The sun rose amid banks of purple and gold clouds, and as there was still work to be done in the fields, the men of the settlement started off directly after the morning meal, leaving the women and children, two soldiers, one old man of 80, and Madelon in charge of the fort. For a long time, Verscher had been unmolested. Settlers had come to feel that perhaps there was not much further danger to be feared from the foe, and with this feeling of fancied security, they had grown less vigilant. Madelon, attracted by the beauty of the day, started to go down to the landing place, which hung over the river and made an admirable spot from which to fish, the river being noted for the excellence and number of fine fish to be found there. Come, Lavalette, she called to a French half-breed who was hired to work about the fort. Bring some lines, and perhaps we can catch fish enough to serve for a meal. They were busily engaged in this peaceful sport, when suddenly the sound of firing was heard in the neighborhood of the place where the settlers were at work in the field. Run, mademoiselle, run! The Iroquois are coming! screamed Lavalette, and taking her by the hand, they fled towards the fort. Can we reach it? Dost thou think? Courage, mademoiselle, we are almost there, replied Lavalette. And so the Iroquois thought also, since they gave up the chase of the flying girl and contented themselves with firing at her and her companion. As the bullets whistled by, she prayed aloud, Holy Mary, save us! And as the words inspired her with fresh courage, she shouted as she neared the fort, Help, help! To arms! Her wild call was not heard and at the very gate itself were two sobbing women who from the battlement of the fort had seen their husbands murdered in the field and stood wringing their hands in misery. Oh, come within, come in, think of the children. And as she spoke, Madelon pushed the two women in before her and with the aid of La Valette shut the heavy gate. Where are the soldiers? was her next question. Hidden in the blockhouse, sister, said Louis. The elder of the two boys came to meet his sister with the gun in his hand. They ran together to the blockhouse, and there, sure enough, were the two men, crazed with fear, and one of them holding in his hand a lighted fuse. What do you with that fuse? 
Light the powder and blow us all up, cried the soldier, while his companion, huddling in the corner, only moaned. Miserable coward! Go from this place at once! And Madelon's voice rang with such determination and command that the man obeyed. See, since none of you dare, I myself will defend this fort, for my father would shame if his daughter could not keep it when there are arms and powder and all those that can use them. Sister, said Alexander, give me a gun, for I too can load and fire one. Truly thou shalt have one, little brother. We shall fight to the death. Remember what our father hath taught us, that men are born to shed their lives for their country and their king. Though I be but a girl, I shall do as he would wish, since neither of you is old enough to take command here. Even the craven soldiers, inspired with some small degree of courage, agreed to follow their intrepid commander. His first order was that they should make a round of the palisades, that high fence of great logs with pointed ends that surrounded the forts and blockhouses, planted in the wilderness, and to which many owed their safety, since they were well nigh impossible to climb, and the garrison within had those that climbed at their mercy. As they hurried to the palisades, Madelon put on her head one of the soldier caps which she saw in the blockhouse. "'Why do you put that cap on, sister?' asked Louis, with a curiosity which he could not repress even at that critical time. "'So that the Iroquois shall not think it's a girl making the rounds. You put one on also, and give one to Alexander.' The feeble band hurried to go round the inside of the palisades to see that all was secure, for on this defense of the heavy logs their very lives depended. "'Thank the Holy Virgin that we came!' Madelon exclaimed, for they found not one, but half a dozen of the logs gone at different places, and had this been discovered by the Indians, there would have been little chance for the small band to have escaped being slain. "'Help, Louis! Push, Alexander!' We can get this log into place while the soldiers set up those that have wholly fallen down. As she spoke, the brave girl and the two little brothers tugged with might and main and got the heavy log in place and held it while the soldiers drove it into the ground so that no opening was left in the palisades. All the other weak spots were mended under her direction. The two men working as she ordered, since they seemed incapable of taking charge themselves. When the palisades were well repaired, and Madelon thought there was no further danger to be feared from that direction, she said, Now we must make the cowardly Iroquois believe there is a strong garrison within, and never let them think that my father is from home. So let each one in turn fire from the loopholes, and see to it, boys, that there is no shot wasted. Finding that the firing was scattering but continuous, the Indians, ever adverse to making an attack on a fortified place, withdrew to the woods. Shortly, however, they discovered some of the settlers who had escaped the morning assault, creeping back to the fort, and with horrid yells, the savages pursued and killed them. The women and children in the fort cried and screamed without ceasing, knowing that their loved ones were being killed without mercy. At last, Madelon, fearing that that they would be heard by the Indians, and their distress taken as a sign of weakness, ordered them to stop, and tried to busy them about the defense. Load and fire the cannon, La Volette. It will serve as a warning to any of the settlers that may have escaped, and I have heard my father say that Indians ever fear a cannon. So the cannon was fired, and Madelon from her loophole saw the tall, painted forms of the enemy take refuge in the forest. But this was not the last duty of the little commander that night. From her place on the bastions of the fort, she saw a canoe with a settler whom she knew well, named Fontaine, coming towards the landing. He was not alone, but had his wife and family with him. I must save them if it is to be the will of God. Lavalette, dost thou see any of the Indians lurking in the wood's edge? There be none very near at hand, mademoiselle. Perhaps a cannon affrighted them. I pray that it may be so, since there is none but thou and I to save our friends, I fear. Nay, there are the soldiers. Sure it is their business to venture to the dock and bring in Sieur Fontaine. Listen thou, La Volette, the while I ask them to do this. The soldiers summoned before their little commander. Though testifying their willingness to follow all her orders within the palisades, 
absolutely refused to risk their lives by going beyond its shelter. "'Twas as I feared. Thou and I must save them, Lavalette. Thou shalt keep guard at the gate, and I will to the landing and bring them hither. Pray, mademoiselle, bid me to go, and thou stay and keep the gate. Nay, for I have heard my father say that the Indian is ever wary about that which he doth not understand. They will marvel why I go alone to the landing, and doubtless think it is but a ruse to draw them hither, so that we may train the cannon on them again. If they appear, go thou in and bar the gate, since we must save the fort at any cost, and as many lives as is possible. So Madeleine, with a bravery that might have put to shame the soldiers skulking within the fort, alone and in full sight, walked down to the landing, assisted Fontaine to take his family and goods from the canoe, and placed the party in front of her, marched back to the fort entirely unmolested. As she hoped, the Indians, seeing her put so bold a face on the matter, suspected they had something to fear from the occupants of the fort. So while they hesitated, Madelon acted. Once within the stronghold, how the little party wept and prayed with joy. Now indeed, I feel as if there was hope, since thou art here to help me, Sir Fontaine. There are enough so that we may divide the watch, and as long as daylight lasts, to fire on the enemy if ever one is seen to show himself. Thou, Louis, and Alexander as well, shalt take turns at the loopholes, and see that thy aim not go astray. The rest of the day was spent in making all the defenses as strong as possible, in which Fontaine gave valuable assistance, for he was a brave man, accustomed to the wiles of the murderous enemy, and wise of the ways of border warfare. At sunset a fierce northeast wind began to blow, and the first snow of the season mixed with hail filled the air, making it deadly cold and a night to try the spirits of the small band who were fighting for their lives. At first Madelon hoped that the storm would drive the Indians to shelter for the night, but they were constantly seen appearing at the edge of the woods, and, as it seemed, making preparations for an attack under cover of darkness, and to gain entrance into the fort that night. Go, Louis, and tell the men that I would speak with them. When the whole force was mustered, there were but six in all, two of them boys, and one an old man over eighty. Madeline spoke to them thus. God has saved us today from the hands of our enemies, and let us pray that we shall escape their snares tonight. As for me, know that I am not afraid. See, I will keep the fort with the old man and my brothers, whilst you, Pierre Fontaine, and the two soldiers, La Bonte and Gachet, go into the blockhouse with the women and children, as it is the safest place. If I am taken, do not you surrender. Even if the horrible Iroquois cut me to pieces and burn me before your eyes, I am but one. And in the blockhouse they cannot reach you if you care for yourselves as you should. So all to your places, and may God keep us through the night. Madeline tromped off to her chosen place of duty with the old man and her young brothers. Louis, she said, choose thou the place on the bastion where thou wilt serve. Alexander shall choose next, then the old man, and I shall take the last. Each did as he was bidden, and all night, through the wind and storm, the two little boys, the aged man whose fires of life had burned so low, and the young girl kept vigil. All night long the cries of All's well rang from the bastion to the blockhouse, making it appear as if the place was fully manned by a large garrison. At about one o'clock, the old man who was on guard at the place on the bastion nearest the gate called out, Mademoiselle, I hear something. Mayhap the enemy. His voice quavered with fear and fatigue, and as Madelon hurried to him, she feared the worst had come. Where is it thou hearest something? asked Madelon, hardly above her breath. There, just below, at the gate of the fort. Surely I see them too, and well I know the poor creatures, since for many a day this summer past have I driven them to pasture. The snow had whitened the ground so that Madelon's bright eyes had been able to distinguish that the dark forms huddled at the gate were the poor remnant of the cattle that had not been killed or driven off by the Iroquois. Summoning the others from the blockhouse, they took counsel together as to whether they should open the gate and let the cattle in. The men were all anxious to do this, but Madelon feared the crafty foe. 
how canst thou tell but what we let in the savages also such creatures of wile are they that we know not if they not be concealed in the hides of the beasts already slaughtered and if we are simple enough to open the gate they may enter the fort an hour passed and still the cattle stood there and there were no signs that the enemy was among them so at last madelon called louis and alexander brothers she said we must get the cattle if it be possible you shall stand on either side of the gate and have your guns cocked while i go forth and drive the beasts in if the indians make a rush shoot and then shut the gate as quickly as thou canst the heavy gate was swung back and madelon stepped out it did not take long for her to drive the few cattle that remained of the generous herd that had gone to pasture that morning the remainder of the night passed away without any further alarms and when darkness disappeared many of the fears and anxieties of the small garrison disappeared also as it is always easier to face the fears that may be seen than those that are born of the imagination defense of castle dangerous part two with the dawning of the second day of the defense of castle dangerous the spirits of all rose all that is except one and this was dame marguerite the wife of sieur fontaine she poor soul had but lately come from paris and was yet a stranger to the difficulties and dangers of life in the wilderness her complaints were unceasing and she gave her husband no rest constantly imploring him to carry her to another fort her selfish thought was for herself alone and she cried save me pierre save me was it to expose me to such horrible danger that you sent for me to come from paris where i was safe and happy i sent for you and our children that we might be all together and make a home in this new free land but methinks that perhaps it had been best to let thee remain where thou wast and where there was nothing to disturb thy ease it is in my heart to wish well that i was there again pierre and had never seen this hateful wilderness oh wilt thou not take me to some place of safety ere i die with fright peace woman and shame me to no further by thy childish plaint for the very children are more brave than thou as for mademoiselle madelon she has the courage of a man though she is but a girl nor will i ever leave this fort while she is here to defend it after this the woman subsided into a peevish quiet which was at least easier to bear than her complaints all the others even those who had lost fathers husbands or brothers put aside their griefs and united in an effort to compass their common safety the meals were served out as usual the work inside the fort progressed as it did each day since each one felt that the best way to keep grief at bay was to occupy oneself in helping others during the middle of the afternoon all the people were called together by madelon so that their situation could be discussed the soldiers poor creatures knew not what to counsel and sought only to stay in the blockhouse the safest spot small account was taken of them though they were the very ones whom the others should have looked for protection sieur fontaine the old man and the two boys were of course for staying and not endeavouring to escape by night down the river encouraged by them madelon made a little speech to the garrison and the women and children under their charge dear friends said she never willingly will i give up this fort rather would i die than that the enemy should gain it hear what my father said to me that it was of the greatest importance that the iroquois should never gain possession of any french fort since if they gained one soon they would grow more bold and think they could get others and after that all safety would be at an end what you say is true enough said the sieur fontaine rising in his turn to encourage the people nor may any of us complain if a girl be brave enough to stay on the bastions for a day and night without rest or repose and whoever carries before us a cheerful face i for one cry viva viva long live the brave madelon viva viva they cried one and all and the feeble garrison returned to their post reanimated and hopeful that relief had come to save them for a weary week they were in constant alarm each day showed them the enemy lurking about and each night made them fearful that the attack 
that had not come during the light would be attempted during the darkness. But every night dragged itself away at last, and each morning brought, if not the help so eagerly expected, at least courage to wait for it. On the eighth night, poor weary Madelone was dozing in the fort, with her head pillowed on a table, and her gun beside her, when she heard the sentinel on watch call, Qui vive? She sprang to her feet, and with her gun in her hand ran up to the bastion. Why called you? Listen, mademoiselle, dost thou not hear a sound on the river like the splashing of oars? Surely, yes. There are voices, too. Canst thou tell if they be French or Indian? No, they breathe so low, mademoiselle. Madelon put her hands to her mouth and called, low but clear, Who are you? The answer came back in the loved French accents, We are Frenchmen. It is La Monnerie who comes from down the river to bring you aid. The gate was flung open wide, but even yet Madelon's caution did not desert her, for she placed a sentinel on guard, and then alone, as she had gone before, she marched down to the landing place to meet the soldiers. When she came face to face with Lieutenant La Monnerie, she saluted, and, Monsieur, said she, I surrender my arms to you. Being a gallant Frenchman, and as yet hardly understanding the situation, knowing that there were soldiers within the fort, he answered, Mademoiselle, they are in good hands. But he smiled as he said it, looking on the girlish form before him, with his soldier cap and heavy gun. Madeleine saw the smile, and who can blame her that she answered, In better hands than you think. Will Monsieur come and inspect the fort? The lieutenant and his forty men followed her up to the fort, found everything in order, and a sentinel on each bastion. He turned with a look of surprise to Madelon and asked, Why does not the commandant of this fort come to receive me? I have commanded this fort, monsieur, during the absence of my father, since there was no one either willing or able to do it. Will monsieur give me his orders? The surprised lieutenant, after looking again about him, turned and bowed. What commands does mademoiselle wish me to give? For my part, there seems nothing for me to alter. If monsieur will relieve the garrison, it would be well, since none of us have been off the bastions for a week. We can well imagine that there were deep and peaceful slumbers in Castle Dangerous that night, and let us hope that the cowardly soldiers had to take their turn at last at the bastion duty. I cannot find in the history that they did, however. Think of the pride and pleasure that Madelon's father and mother felt in their daughter when the news of her bravery reached them. What they said to her when she told them all about it, history does not say either, but the facts of the defense were written down as Madelon herself told them, in obedience to the commands of the Marquis de Beauharnais, Governor of Canada. Even in those dangerous times, when one never knew what peril the next moment would bring forth, and women as well as men took their share of guarding homes and firesides, such wonderful bravery and determination in a girl of fourteen did not pass unnoticed. Through the efforts of those in power, Madelon was highly commended at the great French court overseas, and was granted a pension by the king, to be paid to her each year as long as she should live. In another encounter with Indians many years later, she saved the life of a French gentleman, whom she afterward married. All her life was passed in the midst of peril, and on no occasion when bravery was demanded was Madelon ever found wanting. End of section 4